This is the nature of things. I really don't know of any other place in which the history has been forgotten so fast. So I was surprised when I went to see some of the old men here and started asking them questions and they told me they didn't know anything. I said, how is this? And they told me, well, what happened is that the first missionaries told us that we shouldn't remember anything about our past. So our grandfathers never told us anything about what their history was. And as our fathers didn't tell us and we haven't told our children, we don't know anything. And probably our children will know less. And this is good because the only thing you have to know is the Bible. And well, that's the way that everything was lost. It's hard to imagine that there are still lost civilizations to be found in an age where you can Google a satellite image of your house from space. But Edmundo has a knack of knowing where to look, how to help an island nation that seeks out a lost and deliberately hidden past. Hello. The scattered islands of Polynesia tiny ports of the Pacific, entire worlds unto themselves. They're places where the forests have consumed history. Telling the Polynesian story, wrestling it back from the lush volcanic valleys, searching for pieces of a long forgotten civilization. That is the life work of archeologist Edmundo Edwards. Combien de structures vous avez ici? À peu près. Plus de 50. Plus de 50. Story is in stone here in these islands, from beginning to end. Stone is nearly all that's left of the story, a story that ended shortly after Europeans arrived in the South Pacific. A typical archaeological site in Polynesia is a massive stone platform, each one part of an interconnected engineered system terraced up the valley sides. Today, they mark the foundations of ancient island life, lived elevated on stone for more than a thousand years. Polynesian islanders were tough but vulnerable. They were warriors but they perished by the thousands after contact with diseases that arrived with traders and missionaries from the outside world. The epidemics arrived in a ship that anchored here and 80% of the population died in two weeks. And the priests would say that these diseases were sent by God because they were pagans. As soon as the people converted to Christianity, the first thing they did was destroy all the symbols of their past religion. The most potent symbols on the islands were the tikis, depictions of gods as transmogrified men carved in stone and wood. For the Polynesians, these were sacred works of art, images of who they were and what they believed. But for the appalled missionaries, these were as sacrilegious as the golden calf. In their zeal, the missionaries never wrote down any stories about the lives of the Polynesians, even as culture crumbled before them, even as the new religious converts were forced to forget who they had been for thousands of years. The ancient 
ancient civilization of Polynesia was spread out over a huge triangle of the Pacific. And at the heart of the triangle today is French Polynesia, two and a half million square kilometers of ocean pinpricked with dozens and dozens of islands. Europeans had absolutely no grasp of the place till Captain Cook discovered it in the 18th century. The images we have today of Polynesia at the point of contact were captured by shipboard artists. Images of tattooed chieftains and cannibals, citizens of a highly complex civilization. In the 18th and early 19th centuries, these faces came to define the Pacific. This new idea of paradise inspired the likes of Herman Melville, Jack London, Robert Louis Stevenson, Paul Gauguin. A respite in Tahiti convinced Fletcher Christian that he never wanted to go home again. He and his mutineers forced Captain Bly over the side of the bounty. 2,500 miles from a port of coal! You're sending me to my doom, eh? But the real history of Polynesia is far less romantic. Those diseases brought by the European explorers and whalers crept over the beaches into the jungles and wiped out most of the islanders where they lived. All families died. They started uh, making big uh, holes and to throw all the bodies inside. In some cases, uh, those that survived the family would just jump in with the dead because they didn't want to survive, so they would be buried together and they would die there. And uh, it was a, a terrible thing. It was then that the missionary stepped in and told the survivors it was their own fault. They needed to convert to Christianity immediately or suffer the wrath of God for the years of paganism, worshiping stone idols in the jungle and covering their bodies and faces with tattoos. The priest, the only thing they would try and tell you is that your past was heathen, that your people were all cannibals and they used to eat their babies and they used to do terrible things. People felt a little bit of shame, of course, of this terrible past that, the, that was painted to them by the missionaries. By the midpoint of the 20th century, most modern scholars had assumed that Polynesia was an academic dead zone. Anthropologist Thor Heyerdahl sailed across the Pacific on a balsa wood raft to prove that the Polynesian stone masons actually came from South America. The skill was too sophisticated to have been homegrown. And so the Polynesians were reduced to less than a footnote. There was no culture to cling to for them. Nothing worth remembering. But the priests and the academics were wrong. The Polynesians were a highly mobile civilization of adventurers and explorers searching for new islands. The Polynesian diaspora spread out across the waves aboard sleek seafaring canoes. They were traveling up to the Marquesas. They were traveling to Hawaii, back and forth. They were going to every place. I mean, this was sort of a, a very important center for dispersal and communications. The Polynesians were master navigators, the best humanity has ever known. They took their marks from everything, wind directions and ocean swells, clouds and waves. They assigned specific stars to matching islands and committed the direction of the rising sun to memory each day on the open sea. They astounded Cook with their knowledge of the ocean and the speed with which they could travel. But it ended. It all ended. The world's most spectacular seafaring culture Island nations of people with beliefs and heroics and engineering and skill just stopped existing. And for more than 25 years, Edmundo Edwards has been trying to determine what happened to it. Do you know the chef who lived here before? No. 
The greenery here on the Polynesian islands is pervasive. Clear a site one year, and the vines and leaves will be back the next, like a curtain clinging to the rock faces of the ancient Polynesian story. In this case, a stone platform known locally as a pai pai. A pai pai is a house structure, and it can be a sleeping house or it can be anything. It is a stone foundation, actually. That's a pai pai. It must be around probably 60, 70 meters long by about 40, 50 meters wide. It's a huge structure. They sank wooden posts into crevices in the rock and built peak palm frond roofs under which they slept, ate, carved and tattooed. Ça, c'est un pai pai qui? Un pai pai de, de, du chef d'ici même. Ah bon? Pour voir euh, les jeunes. Uh -huh. Okay. You have worked here for a hundred archaeologists for over a hundred years. Oui. They can never get bored here. Just surveying, I mean. If you want to excavate and do all these other things that are, of course, more interesting to some people, uh, you have worked for a thousand years. Edmundo is a Chilean who lives on Easter Island. He moved there in the 1960s to study the Moai, the huge carved stone heads that pepper the island. The Moai were Edmundo's introduction to Polynesian stonework. His subsequent expertise is what got him invited to do archaeology in French Polynesia. There are five archipelagos in French Polynesia, and the Marquesas Islands make up one of them. The Marquesas are 900 kilometers northeast of Tahiti, just below the equator, on the route the ancient wayfinders would have used when sailing to Hawaii. The French government subsidizes life here. Marquesans reside in villages along the shoreline. This is Hatihu, on the north shore of Nukahiva. Locals live off breadfruit, wild pigs, and baguettes imported daily from Tahiti. After his first visit here 20 years ago, Nukahiva became one of Edmundo's favorite hunting grounds. Most everything in this countryside was altered by people. Even this stream was rerouted to run closer to the stone platforms. But it's difficult seeing the architectural details through the vines and trees. They're looking for petroglyphs, carvings on stone, images of gods, signs of sacred places. The process can be painstaking. Nothing is easy. It's hot in here and humid. Then it rains. The beaches on the edge of the jungle are the most beautiful on earth. But step in here and it's another world. But it's that other world that draws locals like Alphonse Puettini, who have learned from Edmundo that there's much to be proud of here in the valleys of their ancestors. Alphonse himself was born in a house built atop a stone pie pie. Alphonse, he is quite a character. I met him the first time I came here. So we started working with Alphonse. And uh, once Alphonse learned what we were searching for, he had a great eye. And he would run around with a scrub, scrubbing rocks. And he would say, oh, there's a petroglyph here. And from then onwards, he became sort of a specialist in petroglyph hunting. Mm -hmm. 
Every figure that you see, a man's figure, human figure, is named Tiki. It doesn't matter if it's male or female, it's just Tiki that means human being. This is the most common figure that you find in East Horizon and in the Marquesas. It is a, a face with mismatched eyes. Never one eye is identical to the other. One has a dot or one has more circles around it than the other. And it's called Mata Kumoi in the Marquesas. It means the sleeping eye. And this is because it was supposed that when you sleep, then your soul will leave your body and will go to the underworld and meet the ancestors. So these two eyes represent that. And that is why when a victim was sacrificed, the chief would eat an eye. Because this way he had the power to go to the underworld and see what was happening in the spirit world. People don't know the extent and, uh, of these uh, ancient structures and how all these valleys were occupied all the way from the coast to the top of the hills where sometimes forts were installed to protect them from invading enemies from other valleys. But as all has been reclaimed by the jungle today, you don't see this. And very little is known about it. But Edmundo is making discoveries and more dark secrets are about to come out of the black rocks of the Marquesas. A British sailor with a spyglass once spotted a Marquesan man on shore and reported that the native was wearing pants. Then the sailor realized it was ink. The religious men on board were quick to condemn these new desecrations of the flesh, these tattoos. But for Europeans, especially the missionaries, the story of these new people got much more macabre and horrifying the deeper it went into the forest. This pit is on top of a large structure that has a banyan tree growing on top of it. The banyan trees were sacred trees, so I believe that this was a sacred structure. In many cases, these pits were used for refuse, I mean, getting rid of uh, bodies, skulls, all the remains of victims that were sacrificed. Victims were hung from trees, from banyan trees, by a hook that was passed through the shoulder. And uh, they were called ika, that means fish, because it was supposed to be the human fish that was sacrificed to the gods. And uh, they were then laid on top of a, a rock. They were beaten with a club on the head. Then it was, uh, it was cut into bits, sometimes partaken between all the presents. Other times it was just cooked in a pit there, sometimes just sort of singed in the fire. And then everybody would uh, eat it. This is an ancient Polynesian stadium. It would have belonged to a chief, a series of dance platforms and a sacrificial altar called a tahua. 4,000 spectators would fit in here. There was a time not very long ago when this was shrouded by the jungle, just like all the other Polynesian architecture. Nowhere else in the Pacific has such a large structure been uncovered and preserved to the extent that this one has. Each chief would have one of these meeting grounds. And uh, these platforms were stepped, and they were like stadia, where the spectators would sit during these festivals that took place. No place had I ever imagined that they would build structures so large as this one, because some of the stones in the walls of these structures weigh up to about 10 tons. And they, they were available because they've come, they've fallen from the cliff sides, so you just have to roll them and align them. But anyway, it is a gigantic task to do all this. It's a giant space, as big as a soccer pitch. The grass would have been filled with dancers and the ledges lined with food. The chief himself would be the featured performer, displaying his tattoos, standing on his own carved stone balustrade. 
It was his symbol of status. The more tattoos they had on, the more status they had. And it was important for everybody to be able to admire this descendant from the gods because the chiefs were traced as a sense to the gods of creation. The missionaries tried to destroy the tattooing tradition, just like they destroyed the tiki. But the body art is quite literally a cultural marker, like a family crest that links the people to the petroglyphs in the forest. What is interesting is that here we have a whole series of, of petroglyphs of turtles. And turtles was a reserved food. It was considered a sacred animal and it was only eaten by chiefs. Turtles is one of the few animals that they had that could move between two worlds because they uh, live in the ocean and they can also live in the air. And uh, in the bottom of the ocean, it is where the land of the ancestors. So maybe this meant that it was an animal that could communicate between the world of the living and the world of the dead. In 1985, I came up here with Sibon, that is the mayor of this valley. And she said, Edmundo, I'll take you to see the only two petroglyphs that exist here in Hati Hill. And we came up to this part of the valley, and she showed me this rock and another one close by that has these petroglyphs. And she said, those are the only ones. And then we came back at night with a lamp, and we started searching in the rocks around the area, and we were able to discover another 70 petroglyphs that had never been seen before by anybody in this valley. That mayor who called Edmundo to Hatihu was Ivan Katupa. Her ancestors were once tribesmen in this same valley. The continuum of her life stretches back to before the time of the missionaries. So I started asking me, you were born in this valley? She said, yes, I was born in this valley. My husband was the chief of the valley. He was the mayor of this valley. And uh, my grandfather was the mayor of the valley. And uh, my great-grandfather was also the chief of the valley. Because at that time, they didn't have mayors. And before that, my great-great-grandfather was the chief of the valley, he was a lost cannibal. C'est le dernier chef cannibal. C'est le dernier chef cannibal. Il s'appelle Koamua. Koanui? Koamua. Les tombes qu'ils ont là-bas. Ah, c'est lui qui est lui qui était enterré là-bas sur le quai. Il y a lui, il y a son fils et la famille. And he's buried over there, close to the pier. And uh, he was the one who converted to Christianity. Yvonne understands the connection to her ancestors, but she realized that with each passing generation, less and less would be known by the other people of the valley. That's why she asked Edmundo to come to Hatihu to help her people discover who they had once been. A farmer has asked Edmundo to come and see something he's found on some cleared jungle land. Under the hibiscus, he's found a marae, the Polynesian name for a sacred place. I think it is a, a sacred place to say Palkir, or probably a, one of the lineages here. It's one of the Mayas, and uh, probably they would bring the, the skulls that was what people would bury or keep in a sacred place. When a person died, they would expose the body, and then after that, they would, after a year or so, when they had the sort of the final rites, then they would uh, discard all the little bones, and they would just bring the skull and put it in the mei. And uh, it was kept there and was very sacred, and that's where you would keep your ancestors. But he thinks that there's no other bones here. He thinks that the people, they would just cut off the skull, leave the skull here between a rock, and take the other body down below and eat it.
The Marquesans actually used to call cooked human carcasses long pig. These days, real pig will have to do. Edmundo's sidekick, Alphonse, seems to do everything around Hatihu, even cook the feast. The roast pig and the tohuas, and even the tattoos, are all part of a revival, like a long hidden gift from the ancestors. There's money to be made here too, thanks to the archaeology. These pigs will be buried to cook for five hours until company arrives for lunch. The more ruins are discovered, the more tourists want to make the journey to see them. Adventure cruise ships make detours to visit Hatihu. Any local who can carve or cook does good business on a day like this. The clambering tourists give scale to the Polynesian engineering, and we can only guess what kind of skill and labor went into moving these rocks. These boulders are the mysterious monuments of record of a civilization that slipped from memory. But except for some petroglyphs, the delicate aesthetic of the Polynesian grandfathers is nowhere to be seen. On Easter Island, Edmundo can gaze up into the faces of the Moai, the handcrafted likenesses of the ancient islanders themselves. In the rest of Polynesia, the faces were stolen, or worse, smashed to bits like a brutal assault on memory itself. But Edmundo keeps on looking. There's got to be something left to be unearthed, even if these jungles aren't keen to give up anything sacred very easily. Most people outside of Polynesia have never heard of Raivavai. It's tiny, but it's loaded with archaeology. And next to the Marquesas, it's the place where Edmundo goes sight hunting most often. Raivavai is one of the most beautiful islands in the world and it's so far away. I mean, it's remote in the sense that nobody knows about it because it is as beautiful as Bora Bora. Raivavai is at the southern end of the Austral chain sitting right below the Tropic of Capricorn. When the first European sailors arrived here, they called Raivavai High Island because of the volcanic peaks. It doesn't have the myriad valleys of Nukahiva, but it does have its little corners of intrigue. Raivavai used to be famous for its tikis, but that was before almost all of them were destroyed or carted away by collectors and museums. Then there's this one, which for some reason was spared. This is one of the last big tikis that remain here on Raivavai. All the rest have been removed except bits and pieces of statues lying around in the jungle. And uh, this one was removed, I don't know, from what altar. It was brought over here, placed in cement, and has been here since 1920s. There were three small tikis that they had found a few years ago inside one of the taro patches. But when I went to see them, they had been destroyed. The mouth and the eyes have been defaced, apparently with repeated blows from a machete. On Raivavai, Edmundo has been drawn to the marais, the sacred enclosures where the traditional priests performed their rituals. When he found this one, the stones had all fallen over. So Edmundo stood them all back up again. This is uh, the places where the people would gather to make offerings to their ancestors to communicate with the outside world. Here we are in uh, Marae Maungaoto. It is one of the largest marais 
of this lineage that occupied this part of Raivavai. They believed in all of Polynesia that when the world was created, it was created out of a void. So uh, they would come here with their priest and they would communicate with these ancestral spirits, ask for their supernatural power. And then, of course, when time of harvest came, then they would come here again and they would make offerings to these ancestors to thank them for their power. It's curious that the knowledge of all this could have been lost so fast because if we look back, most of these altars were occupied at the beginning of the 1800s. So it's only about four or five generations and everything has been forgotten, lost, because nobody told about the past. But Edmundo won't be dissuaded. There's a story here, and he's slowly piecing it together. He believes that the first people who settled Easter Island sailed from here a thousand years ago. That's why he first came to Raivavai. Edmundo has always sensed the locals knew more than they let on. He heard whispers of family keepsakes, books, kept against the strict instructions of the church. I think that the, there might be a many books here on the island, but people keep them secret. And then, after years of working here, Edmundo is presented with a family heirloom from a once reluctant school teacher, a prize handed down from her grandfather. As people are trying to feel proud of their past and trying to search an identity, it is important now that these books are starting to come out. And I've seen many families that they say, oh, I have a book, maybe one day I'll show it to you. So I'm sure there's a lot of books lying around, but people don't talk about them. Je sais qu'il a laissé aussi des traces écrites concernant, par exemple, la construction de la pirogue et le nom de chaque partie de la pirogue. For an ethnographer, this book is invaluable. There's information on canoes and nets and war clubs, even what the farmers used to grow. Il a laissé aussi quelque chose qui va sûrement vous intéresser, c'est les noms de chaque lance. There isn't very much in here about spiritual life, though. Certainly, nothing about tikis. Of the 60 Mariahs that we have more or less surveyed, probably about one third of them must have had tikis at one time. And there might still be some tikis that are buried someplace. Here we are in Mariah Te Vairoa, one of the most important Mariahs of this island. It must have been the most beautiful Mariah because it had all these little stone figures that were standing on the back wall. Here you have a torso, they're made out of red scoria. They had the arms high up like this. They're all female figures, very beautifully carved. And they were placed in slabs that were on the back wall of this court. Here we are in the court of the Marai. We have these uprights, the others have fallen over there. But in the back wall, you have all these pedestals where the statues were standing. This tiki is in more complete. The body is still attached to one of the legs. The other leg is here, this is the knee. Then it would get sort of wide and go down where it was attached to the pedestal. Here, this is the, the torso. Here you have an arm that was coming up. The arm would go out this way and then turn upwards. Heads are missing. I think that the heads were destroyed because they were considered to be the seat of mana, of supernatural power. So if you wanted to destroy something, you destroy the head. So I think that that's why we don't find any heads. Up here, there's a, there's a paved ramp that goes all the way up to an altar up here. But you can barely see it. Here you can see some of the pavement if you start cleaning it. 
and coral slabs. And, but it's all covered, so it's difficult to see. But the pavement is there. Edmundo has worked on this marae many times in past years. But every time he leaves, the forest consumes it again. With every new visit, it's like he's starting from scratch. Found something that nobody has ever seen before here. Something new and unexpected. Intact. Amazing. Because I did the survey of this marae, and I cleaned all this. Well, here we found a head of a statue. We didn't know what the heads of these statues looked like. Now we know it's the first one that has been found. It's quite extraordinary. It's very different from how I imagined them. It has these very large ears sticking out on the side. And uh, it's in very good condition. So you can see it's like in mint condition. Still attached to it, at least this part. It's under the roots of these trees, so you would have to sort of remove them free to be able to take it out. The only statue that has been found as intact as this was in 1928. Since then, nothing has been found like this. I'm in love with this face. <laughs> I don't know if it's a good idea to leave it here. Maybe we should just take it out, but that would make sort of a major operation because we would have to cut this tree trunk and remove all this part here and cut this other root and, uh, and clean it and take it off. As Polynesians slowly become aware of the importance of their past, the more they are protective of what they have left. When they hear what Edmundo has found, there is bound to be a debate about the tiki head. He'll have to take a risk and leave it in the forest tonight so he can make a call back to Tahiti for advice on the right thing to do. Enter our Nature in Focus photo contest. You could win a Nikon camera or the grand prize, a trip to Quebec City. Visit our website. Everyone turns out for evangelical church services on Rivavai. There are three around this tiny island. Parishioners can take their pick. Meanwhile, the sun hasn't yet penetrated the trees of the Dubai Roa Morai, so Edmundo works by flashlight while morning service continues down the road. Officials in Tahiti told him to dig up the head and measure it, but to be careful, because exhuming a head is a delicate business. Look at it, what a beauty. How often in your life have you made a find like this? Not very often. About four or five times I've found statues. But this is an extraordinary piece. Probably one of the most beautiful pieces from Raivavai in any museum as they have it. It's wonderful. The officials in Tahiti told Edmundo to bury the head again once he was done with it. Too many treasures have left this island. And though many Raivavaians abide with the dictum that the past never happened, many others are getting aggressive about protecting what is theirs. Oh, I'm sure if the present Papete had a photograph of us standing like this, holding this statue, they would be very happy to put it in the front page, and everybody would be running after us. But uh, it's better to keep things calm, because uh, people also are also sort of scared about these statues. There's a lot of uh, so, sort of urban legends that once you find a statue, the statue will kill you, or the spirit of the statue will do harm to your family, or something like that in the following days. So, well, let's hope that nothing like that happens. High coincidence. You better be careful. 
<laughs> we have to be careful. <laughs> the environmental conditions in these islands aren't kind to bones. They tend to rot. A few survive, like those skulls on Nuka Hiva, but mostly there is nothing. So finding a stone head, a carefully carved, ritualized stone head, is like staring directly into the face of the past. The head is a magnificent piece of art, and it's so well preserved, it is, it is beautiful. It's a very beautiful, very stylized head. And uh, I had never seen a head like that in any of the statues of Rai Vavai. I think it is a, a great discovery. I mean, that's a major discovery. The monk did it. Rai Vavai, the past is lost, but the past could mean the future. In another Marai, on another part of Rai Vavai, Edmundo shows some school kids what kinds of places mattered to their ancestors. The fear is that when a culture disappears, it's gone for good. But the secret books and the rediscovered treasures can help inform a new generation about the past that their parents and grandparents were afraid to talk about. In the Marquesa, says the past is alive and the past is their not only their future, it is their present, because they feel honored and they feel proud of their past, they feel proud of their art, they feel proud about so many things in the past. This society here owes a lot to archaeology. Edmundo's interpretation of the story told in stone has helped awaken traditions that were long dormant. The drum dances and the hula are taught here in school now, after centuries of being banned by the church. There is an ease now, a confidence that comes with knowing the real story of who the ancestors were, and in accepting that they died off through no fault of their own. In the beginning of the 1800s, there was an epidemic of smallpox. Nukuhiva had a population between 60 and 80,000 people. And uh, the population went down to about 4,000 after the epidemic. We just cut down all this vegetation. You would have 10 or 12 dance platforms between the small ones and the largest ones. You would have houses all around the valley. You would have roads, you would have pavements. You would have terraces, planted with agriculture. And if you went back into the past, everything would be covered by breadfruit trees that was their main staple. The fathers of these men were taught that their ancestors were savages. But they've learned that all they need is a set of machetes and an archaeologist's expertise to see for themselves that their great-grandfathers were more than heathen cannibals. This history, here in the jungle, is theirs again. The Nature of Things returns next Sunday night at 8 p.m. with a special presentation the Suzuki Diaries. Now, Documentary Night continues with Anne-Marie McDonald and Doc Zone. Airlines don't sing about the friendly skies anymore. We had to wait there for three hours. It was horrendous. Terrible. But don't bet against the airlines yet. The sky's the limit. Next.